Hey, this is Benny Leapshire. Welcome to season six of the Pastors Podcast. By far, one of the favorite things we do all year long is record these podcasts. Really want to come alongside pastors, church leaders, anybody in the trenches building the local church. I get many people that reach out to me and say, I'm not a pastor, but I have such a heart for the local church. I love these podcasts. So we love anybody and everybody that's listening. Welcome. We did something a little unique. We recorded season six at our pastor's conference. We have an annual pastor's conference we do in Sacramento. It is for pastors, church leaders, and their teams. We sat down with with most of the pastors here actually did breakout sessions for us, and then we had them come in and do a podcast. That is the one today. Phil Manginelli will be sit, is sitting down and having a great conversation with Dave Patterson. Phil Manginelli, many of you guys would know, pastors a great church, the Square outside of the Atlanta, in Atlanta, in the suburb. Dave Patterson pastors the Father's House in Vacaville, California, and then heads up kind of a network as well of churches. Dave Patterson at the breakout session of the Pastors Conference was maybe one of the most talked about uh, breakout sessions. People were so impacted, and I cannot wait. Uh, Dave is a father in the body of Christ and is one of the most encouraging pastors I've ever been around. The amount of people that talk to him and just leave so encouraged is is really amazing. I'm excited for you to be able to hear Phil and Dave's conversation. I also want to let you know, listen, we, we're here to come alongside and encourage, connect, equip pastors, church leaders, and we do that through the podcast, through two pastors' conversations. Conferences, one in January in Sacramento, one in June in the UK and Birmingham, as well as we have a school that we offer for leaders in general, but we have many pastors and church leaders that jump in and be a part of it. It's completely online. It is built for people that are currently leading. And so if you want to check that out, JesusCultureSchool.com. Really believe you're going to be blessed by this conversation today between Phil and Dave. Well, welcome to season six of the Pastors Podcast. Um, We are here at Pastors Conference at Jesus Culture in Sacramento. And um, honestly, just getting to be a part of these podcasts is such a privilege for me. And I'm Phil Manginelli, uh, part of the host team for the Pastors Podcast. I'm the lead pastor of a church called The Square uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I am with Dave Patterson and uh, honestly, Dave, I am so honored. We're really thankful. Your voice, um, it's shaped us from a distance. Oh, I know that we, we, we were, we're new uh, friends, uh, but I've known of you and your leadership for far longer than this. And I'm, I'm imagining that there's a lot of people who are listening that feel the same. And so oh, I just thanks. honestly, I want to start with just saying thank you. Voices like yours are rare. You've really been a voice of hope and encouragement. And just as a pastor, just having uh, people who are contending in the direction we feel called to go uh, just means the world to me. So thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. And I would love to just, why don't you just share who you are and uh, just kind of invite us into your world. And uh, for those who haven't had the chance to meet you, just get to to understand who you are and what you lead. Yeah. And I I love the fact that we're just going to free flow and see where this conversation (laughs) goes. I love those kind of interviews and and chats. Well, um, I've been in ministry 41 years, so I've been on the planet for a bit. But we planted a church accidentally 27 (laughs) years ago in a little town called Vacaville, just down the road yeah. from here. And it was kind of a wide spot in the road, you know? Play, yeah. Vacaville is a place you stop to get a burger on the way to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a cosmic humor, I like to look at it that way. And God orchestrated it. Um, it was my wife and I, I was, I was a worship pastor at the time, and we got invited on a Monday night to bring a guitar, and there was three other couples. So there was eight of us in the living room, and uh, the Holy Spirit showed up. Uh, And it wouldn't be long after that in a pursuit after God, which I think all great things come out of pursuit, that the Lord spoke to me to... uh to plant a church. Uh, Back in a day when the planting organizations, the church planting organizations weren't really happening. And uh, there there wasn't a lot of churches being planted, at least in that area. But that's where we started. So we've been there for 27 years in Vacaville from the eight people in the living room. (laughs) And God has done what he does. So multiple locations around Northern Cal and church plants as well as campuses. And we just opened a a campus in uh, Calgary, Canada. So kind of got over the wall on that one. Uh, But God has done some great things. So for 27 years, we've been... We've been building a house for his presence and his glory. It's it's been a great ride. Oh man, I mean, I'm already having to like <laughs> simplify or 
organize the questions I want to ask sure. in the middle of all of it. But I just, it is, um, it is such an amazing thing. I'm, I even think, you know, we were talking before this about uh, where, when we planted, where we started. Yeah. And to see what God has done. And then to close my eyes and go, man, what is, what is 10 more years going to look like? Right. And just the anticipation of what happens when you build a house on the presence of God. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I actually, I would love, you know, one of the things that I know about you and the Father's house and even just what, what you know, you planted from was this undeniable anchor of planting in the presence, on the presence that we were going to stand and we were going to be where God was. He was, he, he's what we're after. And I, I'd like to just hear you talk a little bit more about that. And even sure. what, it, what does it actually mean for you to be a people of his presence? And what do you see in that? So I would just love, I would Good. love to lean into that. Well, I, I believe that, that churches and, and pastors, if you go biblical model, um, we believe strongly in the prophetic word of the Lord. Yeah. That when God is going to build something, when he's going to launch somebody, as it was in you know Acts chapter 13, right? Where they're sitting around and it says, uh, these leaders came together. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work which I've called them to, or Paul, excuse me. So I believe the prophetic word is, is a launching point. And so that's what we did. We, we launched out. And, and as I was seeking the Lord uh, about planting a church, because I had no clue what I was doing, right? <laughs> I, I was a youth pastor. I, I got into ministry in the music deal back in the early 80s. So in the early 80s is when contemporary Christian music bands were roaming the earth, yeah, yeah. right? And g- contemporary Christian music was up and to the right. We were in Huntington Beach. So all these bands were coming out of Southern Cal. And out of that, I became a youth pastor accidentally. Out of that, I became a, a worship pastor for about a decade. And I got I got disillusioned with mm. church and ministry, as so many leaders do. Yeah. So I was a part of a couple unhealthy churches and I was ready to hang my guitar up, you know, hang my harp yeah. on the willows and go back into construction. And uh, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna spend some time just seeking the Lord. And that's really how our church started was a time of separating myself, fasting, waiting on God, saying, God, I'm just here. But I was kind of done with with the church as I knew it, um, yeah. and probably because I'd been exposed to some unhealthy leadership. Yeah. And there's probably leaders and pastors listening in that that is their experience. Yeah. And they've been tainted, jaded, discouraged, disillusioned by a model that is not necessarily 100% God's dream, right? Yep. I said that as gently as I could. <laughs> so out of, out of this time of seeking, um, the Lord gave me a clear word about planting a church, which again, I had, there was no ARC. I, I get no. to serve with ARC, you know, church planting organization, one of the best. Um, there was none of that, but so God gave- the Wild West. God gave me a word and uh, I, I fumbled on to Exodus 33, right? Where God gives Moses, it's a good news, bad news day. Mm. So God says, hey, um, good news, Moses, you get to go into your inheritance. Go on into the promised land. Bad news, I can't go with you because you're a rebellious and stiff-necked people and I'm gonna have to kill you. So, yeah. right? So Moses starts his negotiation. <laughs> and he says, God, if you don't go with us, yeah. do not lead us up from here. Yeah. If your presence does not go with us, then what else will distinguish us from all the other people groups in the earth? Yeah. And that's the verse God gave me is the presence is what will distinguish. Yeah. So we started our church. I didn't know how to preach. I was a youth pastor, so I had a couple sermons under my belt. I was a worship guy, and that was my thing for over a decade. So we worshiped well, yeah. <laughs> and we had a pretty good band. So I that was probably that. the survival of the early church, right? Um, but our, our impetus, the ethos, the launching was this. God, we're not going anywhere without your presence. Yeah. And the way that God grew the church, and still 27 years later, it's this. People come in and they encounter the presence of God. Not just in concept, but the tangible, unavoidable, manifest presence of God. And some are skeptical about that. And, you know, there's camps that throw rocks at the charismatic and Pentecostals and, hey, it's just emotionalism. No, it's actually the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And I don't want to offend him. So what we did is we built a church saying we're going to honor the presence and be a house of worship. And that will be our number one priority. And, of course, there's discipleship and programs and systems and youth and camps and, you know, everything. And as the church grows, it gets more complicated and there's more staff and more things to do. Um, So we have marriage ministry ministry and, you know, Financial Peace University and all the bits and pieces. But still, after all these years, 
It's still the presence. Yeah. That is, if there's a secret sauce, it's people encountering, which is our vision. I want people to encounter the reality of God. Yeah. Because we have, and you can interrupt me, I'm kind of preaching oh, it, you man, know. I'm fully receiving. <laughs> we have what no other religion has, right? Yeah. And that is the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit manifesting his presence in our gatherings. It's so true. Right? Psalm 22, 3, God says, you show up and lift up to Hela, that high praise, and phew, he's yeah. enthroned. And when he's enthroned, his authority comes into the room and people's lives are, are just healed and restored and marriages and vision and all that happens in his presence. So yeah. that's been our, oh, our humble strategy for 27 years is prioritize his presence and let's well, I think, go. I think it matters. So many times people have come into our church, you know, they're either far from God in prodigal seasons or you know, just have never known Jesus and they're, they're kind of moving towards faith and they'll come in and, on a Sunday morning. And, and they don't have language for it, right? right. It's, it, but there, there's tears in their eyes, and they're like, there's something here. I love that. The thing I love about what you are doing, represented, and kind of in many ways have, have gone forward, is because now when I look at church, you know, just thinking about all of the church planning strategy, all of the church planning networks, and they're so helpful. Yeah. Uh, I am so thankful for the way we're walking alongside people. But there are times now when, I, when I'm walking with other church planters and I hear all of their strategy, I hear all of this training that I, I never had and all of these things, and, but there's still this place of going, oh, but. But without your presence. Yeah. But without the presence. You know, at the end of the day, I, mm -hmm. I, want, I dream of a church of excellence. I want, okay. a, I want a church that everything we do, we do so well. I want to be the best leader I yep. can. But there's two things above all things. I want to be faithful and I want the presence of God. Good. What I'm seeing in so many young church planters is that that doesn't somehow rise to the surface. And I, and I ache for that for them. Yeah. I, I want, I, in the midst of all that, that's now available, right. you, there's just this thing in me that says, oh, don't miss this one thing, because it's the only thing. Sure. You could have all the strategy in the world, but if you don't get this, yeah. it, it's not going to last. Totally. And, and there's a prophetic picture in uh, Ezekiel 37, right? And it's the Valley of Dry Bones. Yeah. So God takes Ezekiel, leads him down to this valley. And I love this line, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Yeah. So every great leader's story starts with that. The hand of the Lord was upon me. We can do without a lot of stuff that we do in church. If you, if you think about yeah. it, there's a lot of lame duck ministries that need a decent burial. There's a lot of manufactured energy. <laughs> there's a lot of systems and programs we could do without. There's no doubt about it, but we cannot do without the hand of the Lord. But I, I've looked at that prophecy and here's what you have. You have the bones and you have the breath. Hmm. So the bones was an army of Israel yeah. that, that got slaughtered into captivity, but there was a real army. But isn't it interesting that God actually needed in his sovereign plan, he needed the bones. Wow. The bones would become the army. So when I look at yeah. the bones, I look at structures, systems, yep. strategies, planning. And, and all I do, I get to serve on the lead team of ARC. We provide some great bones yep. of this is how you build it. This is your launch budget. This is all that we do. And it works. But if churches just have the bones, yep. it's nothing without the breath. Yep. Right? So it's both and. It's not one or the other. But a lot of churches and church planners, they got really good at putting the strategy and the program together in somewhat and, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under a bus, but we can neglect the importance of the breath. Yeah. God breathing on what we've structured and his presence carrying us along. Yeah. So that, I lean in that direction. Oh, I you love know, Every church has a lean. Right. And so we're just, God, bring your breath. You know, yeah. we've planned, we've programmed, we got our set list. You know, and so how many churches are, are you know, being ruled by uh, the minutes on planning center? Yep. You know, a slave to the planning center document. And we do planning center and we strategize and we believe in excellence and we got all the bones, yep. right? But at the end of the day, our agenda is disposable, yeah. right? When he I'd walks into the room. I wanna live with a disposable agenda yeah. and say, God, we're ready to do this, but then what do you wanna do? Yeah. And what I found, the larger the church gets and the more people and staff and live stream the other campuses, it's more of a challenge. Yeah. But we've taken on that challenge and said, God, we're gonna prioritize your presence. So, I, I mean, I think one of the questions I, I've just feeling from this is, I know this within myself and I know it from a lot of people that, especially when you're in your first seasons of either church planting or senior leadership, 
that it, it, it's just easy to feel that tension. And I, that the desire of going, if, if we don't build something that's strong, if we don't implement the right structures and systems, if we don't be the right leaders, we can be. And then this, this sense of how do we be a people uh, of, of the spirit? Because I, I also find, I don't know if you see this as well, that, that because there is this angst that kind of often drives us into planting. Even, even for me, you know, my story, I came from a healthy church, but I was still in this place of angst. I realized that we had led this youth and college ministry and God did these amazing things. And I, what I couldn't deny though, was for all of these years, I had had the honor in, in a very real way of leading a lot of people to Jesus from this Love public it. ministry. But I hadn't led anyone to Jesus on my couch. Uh, and I felt it. Like I just, like even a huge part of the drive that was in me towards church planting was I need to touch the real kingdom. There's, there's elements of the life of Jesus that I feel missing in me. And I just need to know that the gospel works on my couch as much as it works on a stage. Yeah. And in that angst, what I find is that people who come from really charismatic environments want to plant the most structural churches they've ever seen. <laughs> and people who come from really like high leadership, high structured churches just want to have this just openness. and Well, that's that pendulum yeah. dynamic, right? <laughs> yeah. The pendulum swings and then we overreact to yeah, the pendulum. So and we, true. we go in the other direction. So, yeah. It's so true. <laughs> and so I just want to know, even as people are feeling the tension of both, and they're both valuable. Sure. How would you practically walk people through, what, is it, what does it mean to want both, but to prioritize the presence? Well, for us, it, you know, I, and I mentioned in our previous chat before we came online, that there's some things that we've done for the last 27 years that have, that have really been the secret sauce for us. And I came from a prayer meeting this morning. Every Wednesday morning for over 20 years, we prayed with our pastors. And before we had pastors on staff, I had a couple leaders. I'd say, yeah. hey, meet me on Wednesday morning and we'll meet at my house and we're just going to pray. So this morning we prayed with all of our pastors from our locations and we pray together. And then we have a night a week, uh, we call it Pursuit, and mm -hmm. it's the all-church prayer meeting. It's a prophetic gathering. Uh, we clear all the seats off the floor. It's a mosh pit meeting, yeah. and it's prayer and prophetic. And there's a quote, I, I believe it's accredited to Spurgeon. He said, as the prayer meeting goes, so goes the church. Yeah. So that has been the driving force. It's the, it's the prayer machine underneath. Yeah. And what I believe is the river that we enjoy on the weekend is a direct result of the yeah. digging from the middle of the week. Yeah. So we don't strive. I love that verse that says, cease from striving and know that I'm God. Yeah. So there's so many churches that strive on the weekend, yeah. trying to get there and even doing warfare on a Sunday morning. That's not a time to dig. It's yeah. not a time for warfare. That's a time to flow in the river of God and enjoy his presence. But there must be a price paid through prayer and fasting. Yeah. And I think that back to your question, the key for every leader, yeah, go to, go to the seminars and the conferences, learn from other people, gather as much as you can, you know, get the bones together, yeah. build the best structure you possibly can, and raise the bar of excellence. But then, what's your secret place like? Yeah. So there is the key. You know, yeah. David was a Psalm 27, four guy. That's his life verse. One thing of I desire to the Lord, and that will I seek. I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon his beauty and to seek him and inquire of him in his temple. So as a lead pastor, I wanna be a gazer, a seeker, and an inquirer in yeah. the secret place while nobody's watching. Yeah. And out of that, he built the strongest kingdom in the history of Israel, right? Yeah. And he had all the wealth and the structure and he had all the stuff, the bits and pieces. We're not worried about those. So for us, it's been, how's that secret place going? Yeah. And I own it, it starts with me. Yeah. Even to studying the word, yeah. For me, that can be so stressful, right? Mm -hmm. What's this weekend's word? Yep. And, and then if you preach a good one, then you set the bar and everybody, the expectation's up. You're like, oh, I hope I don't face plant next week. <laughs> <laughs> There's pressure it's involved so in true. it. So here, and this might be a tip for some, we meet with our lead team or our, our preaching team and we get an idea in a series and we brand it. We do all the stuff that everybody does. But then when I get ready to, to prepare the word, it starts on, on my face before the Lord. Yeah. It starts, and I, I, my practice is I've got a Bible on my right hand and a journal on my left. And I, I just get before the Lord with nothing but the text Man. and seek his face. And out of the secret place, I get my prophetic, 
kind of track I get to run on. So yeah. that's been how that's been how we do it, and that carries over into the weekends. It carries over into the preaching. It carries over into the leadership team. So if I can encourage pastors, uh, is how's the secret place doing? Yeah. How much time are you spending alone with the Lord, and are you coming out of that place yeah. doing ministry? Because man, when you do, uh, there's a freedom, there's a grace, yeah. and the striving just falls away. <laughs> so and I've true. done a, I've done enough of both, and I'm sure yeah. you have too. Same. The striving and the doing it out of natural gifting and no anointing is exhausting. Yep. It makes you want to quit ministry. Yep. But when there's a flow of the Spirit and God's grace, then yeah, we can do this. I'm not often discouraged, but if there is something that is, man, maybe not discouragement is the right word, but it's surprised me in this season, has to, to see actually how many churches function in a prayerless culture. Yeah. And then it does, it brings this level of clarity of like, oh, yeah, that'd be tough. I don't even I don't even know how to pastor outside of intimacy with Jesus, and I, I don't even say that as a strength. I just say that it is. I'm yeah, I'm right? too. It, I'm so desperate, desperate. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I realize the burden, the burden of actually what it would look like to try to pastor or plant a church without it. And I, you know, for me, is really when you're talking through this. I, there's this moment. We, we moved to Atlanta, and uh, you know that first season of church planting was really hard for me because what I didn't realize was how much it was going to expose every insecurity right. that I thought I had gone through. And, you know, when we were youth and college pastors, we really experienced some beautiful things. God moved. And to whatever level, there was like a, some growth of reputation. And if you would have asked me before we planted, you know, if I took my identity and my performance or who knew me or this thing kind of things, I would have said, no, you know, I've got my stuff, but that's not my stuff. Then we plant. And then I realized it's all my stuff, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I remember this moment of all of my fear and insecurity and striving kind of coming to the surface. I was on this, going on a walk around a coffee shop in our city. And I just had this awareness of repentance. And I just said, Jesus, my whole life I've told you you're enough. Mm. And I've lied to you. Wow. Like you're not enough. You plus being known is enough. And yeah. I don't, like, I don't know what to do with that. Like it, it just, this, I mean, this grief hit me. Mm. And I, <laughs> I think I even realized as much as God sent Emily and, and myself to Atlanta to plant a church, uh, he sent Atlanta, you know, to us. To, to rescue some things in us we couldn't sure. even see. And it was, I think, even though I had deep values around the presence of God and I wanted to plant the right way, it, it was walking through that season that just cemented, um, man, I can do this out of all of the wrong things. And it really, it really grieved me yeah. because it, 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 I couldn't fully see it. And then it took the the pressure of planting and the fear of failure, which was very strong in my life at the time, to suddenly bring to the table, oh, I trusted me. Yeah. I trusted my performance. I trusted who I knew. I trusted what people thought about me. And when those things were gone, I was drowning. Yeah. And it's just the rescue of Jesus. Come on. It changed everything. Come on. It changed everything. And now, now I just long that other pastors would find that same place. You bet. Well, everything rises and falls on leadership, as it's been said. So God is, is shaping us, isn't he? I mean, that's yeah. what you're describing, is that, that process on the inside of us where we have more capacity. And really, it, it comes back to the initial commissioning of, really, what am I called to do? I'm not called to build a megachurch. I'm mm. not called to have a, a TV show or you know how many campuses I can plant. I'm called to Matthew 28, 18, yeah. make disciples, preach the gospel, and be obedient to my call. So I, I think God develops us, and you describe this process of realizing it's not the numbers, the accolades, the success as everybody sees it. And I understand the, the pressure, especially now with church planters, because you know we blast it out there, and we social media, and we do the training, and yeah. we advertise it, and then everybody's watching to say, okay, how'd you do? You know, <laughs> how's that going for you? <laughs> So it can be it can be a lot of pressure, but but taking it back to, and I think in this season in this era of church planning and church development, I'd like to call people back to the thought of 
the call of God. Yeah. I think church planning and ministry and be a pastor on staff for many has become a vocation. Yeah. It's a vocational option, but you don't find that in the word. No. You find moments where there's a clarity and a call. Yeah. Jesus walks along the shoreline and says, hey, Matthew, leave your tax booth. And uh, Peter, drop that net, yeah. follow me. You find Paul with his encounter with God, Timothy being called out by Paul because of his faithfulness and Barnabas, and we could go on and on. There's a moment of calling. So I, I want pastors to return to, what did God call me to do? Yeah. What is that moment? And again, where we were talking earlier, there's a prophetic essence. Yes. I, I believe in, in being in prophetic atmospheres. And you know, Paul told Timothy, he said, because he was in the thick of it, he said, fight a good fight and this warfare with the prophetic word that you received yeah. when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Yeah. To me, that's the moment. It's taken it back. And we've hit the wall many times in life and ministry. And I've seen church splits and pastors fall. And I've been served on churches that got really messy and ugly. And I questioned all of it. Yeah. And even to the point of disillusionment. I still love God, but I was done with ministry. That's yeah. why I was before I planted the church. But what, what kept me? were encounters where I knew God called me. Yeah. And I revisited that call. Oh, man, David. Man, it's so, so simple, good. but it's I so know. profound. It I is. think you can run the rest of your life on one encounter with God where there's clarity, I've called you to this. Yep. So, you know, you look at Paul, shipwrecked, beaten, left for dead, chucked into prisons, all that he went through. But I believe the call, the initial encounter on that road yep. and God's grace on his life is a sustaining factor. Yep. So I would call every discouraged pastor to revisit the call. Yep. What did God speak over your life? What did he speak over that church? And I, I get them out before, I'm old school, right? So no, it's amazing. I've got like a file of prophetic words <laughs> still in you know ink to paper, so yep. to speak. And over the years, I've got those out and just laid them on the floor and said, God, you spoke this over the house. She spoke this no. over our future and warned with that, that prophetic word. Yeah. No, I, I, I actually think, and I think for anyone who's listening, if you've not done that, yeah. I mean, I, I would say sitting down and actually to the best of your ability, writing those down, sorting those emails, printing them out, it is such an anchor. Yeah. And when we walked through initially through you know, COVID and everything that happened in 2020, we, we had this massive you know, blip in um, about 400 adults left our church in, I think, about six months. Whoa. It was blinding. And um, I have no vision for anything else. I don't know if I'd qualify as a barista or what, you know, so it's like, this, <laughs> this, is, this is it. This is it, or it's Where not Where else pretty, can we go, right? Lord? Yeah. But I kept thinking through the cost of, of replanting in some way. Certainly that wasn't necessarily the, the right lens, but just to allow the severing and the cut and the pruning sure. and the, all that was in it. And to move forward, I think there, was, I, there were these moments where I looked at it and I thought, oh, do I have the energy, the capacity sure. for this? And it was, it was actually the Lord in those moments drawing me back to what he called me to Come do. Come on. And it was re-anchoring my heart and why we planted. To the original call of it. Which is... Yeah. For the sake of oh, the city, on. you know, yeah, and, it, and I needed that. Like I realized, no strategy, sure. no talent, no nothing could give me what I needed to move through that season. Yeah. What I needed was to go back to to the love of God for yeah. people, and, and the love of God for people. I think what keeps me digging in the trenches, and as I said, you know, been in ministry four decades. It comes back to what you just hit: is when we really love Him and we're following that call. It's the transform lives. Give yeah. you one example. This Sunday, so it's a, a, a fresh story. Mm. And I like to worship down in the mosh pit. We have a lot of college <laughs> age, and we don't call it the altar, but whatever. Both work. Um, so I'm down there, and I see uh, a young lady from one of our other campuses, and she's she's a rock star on the basketball team. And she brought one of her friends, which is, I think, a cheerleader at her school, never been to church. So they come in, I wave them down to the worship, and I can see the girl standing there like, where am I? It's loud. There's people all around me. So I get up, and I'm sharing the word, and I get to the end, and we always give people a clear invitation to say yes to Jesus. And I look down, and this young lady, first time in church, yeah. lifts her hand. And so um, church is over, everybody's praying for folks, and we're dismissing and all that happens. 
And I look over and, and these two young ladies are down on the front row. And so I just went and sat down and talked to the new girl. Her name's Natalie. And she's bawling. You know, hmm. got the mascara stripes. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and I said, I said, Natalie, um, I saw you lifted your hand to accept Christ. I said, what's what's going on in you right now? What's happening? She goes, I don't know. I don't know what's happening to me. I said, let me tell you, that is the love of Jesus. Yeah. And that's the person of the Holy Spirit. That's God welcoming you home. Yeah. And it was such a beautiful moment. Now that right there is why I do ministry. Yep. And so I, I think too many pastors get caught up when their church gets big. We have a green room culture yeah. and we preach our message and we get swept back to the back room and you know we have a buffer of people and security around you, however that works. But for me, to sit with a young lady and her friend, first yeah. time in a house of God, yeah. accepting Christ. That's what lights me up. Yeah. And when you were mentioning that. Back to the simplicity, why am I called? Leading someone to Christ. And, and those moments, it, man, I'm, I'm ready to run. I'm ready to go. Same. Let's keep going. No, I mean, it, it really, it, it's um, n- nothing. Nothing can sustain the cost of ministry yeah. outside of the call of yeah. ministry. I think it's a lost practice. Hmm. And one of the things I've learned is, I, you know, I, I basically walked through adolescence without technology, didn't get my first cell phone until I was married. And so even though I'm, I'm kind of right on that millennial edge, that in between Gen X and millennials, I find that I think far more like, like the boomer. generation older than me. And it, just even a few years down, there's something about the way that, that kind of technology has shaped people that some of these simple practices yeah. just get lost. Yeah. Let me revisit one thing before we get too far away from it, because I was while you were chatting, I was thinking about this, is, is the prophetic word of the Lord yeah. and the power of that. And I would just encourage you know pastors, leaders, whoever's listening, if you're not around a prophetic atmosphere, yeah. to find one. Yeah. And just a shout out for this conference, the Pastors Conference and uh, Pastor Banning and Jesus Culture, such a prophetic atmosphere. Yeah. And even the, the folks that are here this week and to get to this conference and others like it, to be in that atmosphere, your odds of running into the word of the Lord and a prophetic yeah. encounter. So actually making, um, taking the initiative to get in those places where yes. God was speaking. Um, yesterday, I was speaking a breakout session here at the conference and uh, a lady come, came up and she just had a question at the end of the session. And she pastors in a small community in Wyoming. Hmm. And uh, as she started asking me the question, immediately God gave me a, a prophetic word and a, like a word of knowledge for her. Come on, Dave. And, and I wasn't looking for it and she wasn't asking for it. But you know what it was? It was the atmosphere. Yep. It was the prophetic atmosphere that is on this gathering. Yep. So, you know, um, you'll, you'll find this in the, in the uh, Old Testament when Saul, you know, got among the prophets yes. and they're like, hey, even Saul's prophesying. <laughs> what the heck's going on? <laughs> so there's something about a prophetic atmosphere. No, so I would just encourage those, any pastors that are discouraged, disillusioned, what's next? Hey, get on a plane, get in your car, get to where God is moving in a yes. prophetic atmosphere. So I just want to throw oh, that out no, there. Oh, no, Dave, no, that's, and, and I even think about you know the challenge of leadership is that it, it's it can be isolating yeah and there's a loneliness to leadership that's part of it you know but I believe that part of what happens in that is we far too easily give in yeah and I've found myself in seasons you know there's that that, that voice of insecurity or loneliness that that wishes you know I don't know that people were coming towards you or you or those things and even where there's some fairness you know but that just not giving into that and going right. no if I if I have a need, I'm going to go find it. Yes. And, and I, I do think that there is a lot of leaders who feel alone, who feel yeah. isolated, whether they're in a smaller community like a Wyoming, which is we have so many pastors are not in these major areas. That's right. Or even where you just feel like you're alone in your community. And that taking that initiative to go, I need allies. I need fathers and mothers. Yeah. I need the presence of God, and I need that prophetic word. And, and there is, you get in those environments, and God meets you. Yeah. I, I just, you know, it's funny even thinking about my f- entire friendship with Banning started with a, with a real place in my life of, of needing God to meet me. And I just felt that, you know, this is, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, drove down to Bethel from Seattle, and uh, just I was there distinctly because I just needed needed God to meet me in some things. Randomly, uh, it's a Friday night service. Banning's on the prayer team. I was a youth pastor. He was a youth pastor. I knew who he was, of course. Jesus culture is just dominating, the, you know. And um, but I just went up for prayer, 
And the, not only was the, the word of the Lord that week shaped so much of the future of my life, lo and behold, uh, he gave me you know, this friendship, this ally that would also mark the future of my life. Yeah. And I just think that's like God. Yes. That we come and we have this need, and not only he meets the need, um, but he gives us more than we could ever well, imagine. And he does it through relationships, yeah. and that's what you're explaining, uh, describing with Banning. What I found in, at times and seasons of ministry, it's relationships. Yeah. It's pastors and friends and ministries that are, they've gone before me, they're where I need to go, or they have something that I don't have. But we have to position ourselves. We yeah. have to get in proximity. You know, when I was a young church planner, didn't know what I was doing, God graciously put a couple in my life, Pastor Wendell Smith, Seattle, Oregon. And he called me one day and I'd done some worship at some events that he was leading. And, and he said, Dave, he said, I, I've started a, a network kind of organic of churches and you've been on my heart. Uh, would you want to be a part of it? Hmm. And I said, let me pray. Yes. It was that quick. <laughs> but then what I did is I got on a plane every yeah. chance I got and I flew to Seattle. Yeah. And so from Central Cal, and I was up there for every conference, every retreat. Sometimes you just want to play golf and hang yeah. out. I'm there. Why? Because the value of one relationship yeah. and the connection that was made, and through that other relationships, and it just yeah. keeps dominoing it does, and it open, doors open up and to pretty soon you're networked with a tribe of people that really without them, we wouldn't make it in ministry. We wouldn't yeah. be where we are today. So recognizing that and you hit a key thing is you can initiate it, yes. right? You can't pick your family, but you can pick your mentors. Yes. And uh, you, you can take the initiative and, and, and then God opens those doors. I think for us is recognizing what level of connection I need to be with certain people yeah. and what, what do I need to pursue? And, and in that, things begin to open up and, and take us to a place we've never been. Oh, so, okay. Uh, I have just this, I feel jealous to ask this question where it's connected to is, so when you look and you are, you're seeing, you know, you're deeply connected with so many young pastors and leaders and you're watching as they're contending, if you could pick, you know, two or three things for every either church planner or pastor under four, whatever it is, just, just that uh, people are still in that formation process of what it means to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. And what are the missing things you're seeing? What would you mm. say to everybody? Well, that's a great question. I would say get yourself out of anything that is, is provoking comparison for yeah. sure. You know, maybe don't spend so much time on the, on the social media platforms. Uh, Re-establish your call, yeah, and then identify your tribe. Identify who are the people I need to walk with, and and really commit. I think a lot of pastors yes. I see they're bouncing around to this conference and that. Yep. And I'm not anti-denominational at all. There's some healthy things happening in denominations, but a lot of times the denomination is not your tribe. Yes, your tribe is is a group of people. There are God-appointed divine relationships and connections, uh, and so finding that place where you fit and then committing to it. Um, I see too many young mm. pastors bouncing around to this group or this conference or this thing, and kind of floating here and there. Uh, and, and you know, receive from whoever you can. I'm not. I'm not against that. <laughs> but there comes a time where you need to say, "Hey, I'm going to build something over the long haul with yeah. this group of people. I'm going to come into some relationships and value those relationships." I think that's a real key yeah. uh, for pastors to move on. Um, and then things we've mentioned, you know, establishing a prayer life that is so foundational to your ministry. Uh, and then here's another one that uh, maybe this is personal and, and you, mm. can, you can jump in and share what God spoke to you about it. But here's, here's what happened when we planted. I was in this negotiation. I didn't want to be a lead pastor. Mm. And what I've seen is uh, sometimes leaders that God really uses were reluctant at the front end, yep. the reluctant Same. leader. So I didn't want to be a lead pastor. Uh, my dad was a pastor and, and, and that didn't end well for him. Yeah. Um, I had bad experiences with church planners. I'd, so I, I didn't want to do that. But once I knew the Lord was calling me to plant a church and to be the thing I really wasn't looking forward to, <laughs> here's what I said. I said, Lord, I just want to do this one time. Yeah. And he asked me for the commi this commitment. He said, will you spend the rest of your ministry years in this city? Hmm. Will you plant here and never leave? Man. That's a, a conversation I had with the Lord. And no condemnation if you've moved around to a couple of yeah. locations. That's not what I'm going at. 
I think there's something, and I think you feel this in, in Atlanta where you're at, is you're committed yeah. to that community and to the planning of the Lord. Yeah. And I'm here for the long haul. When we planted the church, I was 36. Yep. And I knew I will be here for the rest of my days yeah. in this city. Um, I, oh, would encourage, so I would encourage pastors to prayerfully negotiate that level of commitment. Because you, you can't build anything even in five years and 10 years. No. It's built over the long haul. And now what we're seeing, um, my daughters are on staff and their, their husbands are pastors and now grandkids coming up and Come all on. that I've seen. It's the dream. But the, the strength of our church now is generational. Yeah. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob church, right? Yep. But Abraham's got to hang around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? And you, you got to pour into the next couple of generations. Oh, no, so Dave, that'd be I another thing. Huge. Get planted, commit to longevity, find your tribe, dig a well in prayer and worship. And uh, you'd be surprised. Okay, one more quick story. Oh, no, that's so good. So I was uh, traveling with a music group early on, and I was so discouraged. This is how I got into ministry. And I'm at this little church out in the deserts of, of uh, Central California, and I just remember wanting to quit. And I'm sitting on the front row after the service. Everybody left, and I'm just sitting there, just decimated. And this old pastor comes out, and he sat down next to me, and I started whining, <laughs> playing my violin. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, he said this. He said, Dave, you will be amazed what God will do with your life if you'll just keep showing up. Man. Then he got up and he walked out of the room and left me with that. And I've carried it ever, for 40 years. That's amazing. And I would want to say that to some pastors today. You will be amazed at what God will do with your life if you just keep showing up. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> the way Emily and I feel about Atlanta is, you know, it, we would have to have an angel show up in our room and tell us, I'm calling you somewhere else. Good. And we, we would follow the Lord wherever he led us. But we want to lay down our lives for a city far beyond my vocation. I didn't feel a pressure that if I wasn't super successful by 30, I was failing. It just wasn't, I don't think that was in the environment. And now there's this whole atmosphere about immediate success. Mm. And I just think the wisdom that you just shared is just like, certainly we want, we want to see the kingdom move. I want to see young leaders do the incredible long things. It's the long but game. it is the long game. Mm -hmm. And it is the longevity that transforms. Yeah. And there is seasons in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s of such significance for the kingdom. And there's this pressure I see so many people carrying that if I'm not successful now, I'm failing. And I just think it's a lie. Leonard Sweet wrote this book a long time ago, 11, I don't even remember if I remember the title of it, but the very last chapter, he's talking about these essential relationships you need in your life. And it really shifted something for me. The very last one he talked about was you need your Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading that chapter talking about what this, this vision of having relationship with a place. Oh, gosh, we need to do a second podcast. I want to just, <laughs> I just want to lean in and I know we got to close. But there is something about giving yourself, even if God at one point moves you, redirects right. you. But that place of going, I'm going to be here like I'm going to die here. Right. I'm going to love here like, I'm, like my, my grandkids are going to be reaping the fruit of everything I did. It just changes it. Yeah. It just changes it. Oh, Dave, so, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks. It's I mean, a fun chat. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I feel like I'm going to go process a handful of things myself. Uh, I mean, that's only, I told Banning, the only reason I do this is just because um, <laughs> I basically view it as a mini session for myself. Great, but, man, great. Um, honestly, Dave, thank you. And what an honor to have you. Thanks, and, man. You know, for everyone listening, I just, I really encourage you to actually take some of this and move towards it. If you, if you haven't gotten yourself in a prophetic atmosphere, do it. If you're feeling that sense of loneliness, reach out. Come if you on. haven't just had these moments where you've looked back on these anchored words of God, just mm. time to do it. And if, if you don't have a prayer gathering, <laughs> if you don't have a prayer oh, life, man. reach out to somebody you trust and get on it now because the presence of God is everything. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, man. <laughs>